So I just finished Resident Evil 2 2019, and I'm like... Hi, welcome to Chili's. Hello there guys, Billabo10000 here, bringing you episode 4 of So I Just Finished, the series where I finish a game, be it old or new, and give you a pseudo guide slash review, giving you some tips, tricks, and a leg up if you choose to start this game, as well as my honest thoughts on whether it's actually worth your time or not. My original plan for this series was to do this weekly, however, after doing a lot of thinking and thinking about my other commitments, such as how I stream four nights a week, and how I have to do daily uploads, and how I have IRL stuff to take care of, it's not exactly possible to do this every week, so I have come to a decision. Now, this series will not have a set schedule per se, however, there will always be an episode in development, so you can always look forward to a new So I Just Finished, and I'm gonna try and get at least two episodes out a month, at a minimum, because you guys at least deserve that. Patrons will get access to the episodes 24 hours before they go live, and because of the liberal schedule that I'm gonna have with this series from now on, that's a pretty easy promise to keep, so I'm really glad I can give the patrons something to look forward to. This way, I don't have to rush myself, and you guys get some awesome content at the end of this process. Now, I did say at the end of the last episode that I was going to be covering The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening, and I still want to do that episode, but the sweet nothings of Raccoon City, the moans of zombies, it's calling to me, it's whispering in my ear telling me, play me, play me, play me, and obviously I can't resist the allure of a survival horror experience, so today... We're taking on the Resident Evil 2 remake. Without further ado, let us begin. Resident Evil 2 2019 is a remake of the original Resident Evil 2 for the PlayStation 1, released back in 1998. Being the second game in the Resident Evil franchise, this was heralded as a fan favorite, being many fans' favorite game of the series due to the increased scope. You weren't simply exploring a mansion, you were exploring a city. Now, this wasn't the first Resident Evil game to receive the remake treatment, as back in 2002, Resident Evil 1 was remade for the GameCube and re-released on modern consoles years later to critical acclaim. Updated voice acting, a much better graphical style, the Resident Evil remake surpassed fans' expectations and left people wondering a very important question. If Resident Evil's remake was so successful, when would we be getting a Resident Evil 2 remake? Well, it took them quite a while, but at E3 2018, during Sony's press conference, Resident Evil 2 was revealed to be in the works and being remade from the ground up. Not only was it going to be running on the Resident Evil engine that Resident Evil 7 used, but it was going to feature new voice actors, an updated story, and an entirely new look at the Resident Evil 2 locations we've all come to know and love. Capcom made sure to let us fans know that they didn't feel this was simply a remake of Resident Evil 2, but instead a reimagining, retaining certain aspects like locations and characters, but changing up the gameplay, scrapping tank controls, and giving players an over-the-shoulder experience that was more similar to Resident Evil 4 through 6. Enemy placements were changed, areas were overhauled, and as critics and fans got to play event demos of the game, the response was positive. Going into 2019, fans were awaiting the Resident Evil 2 experience with bated breath, and all that was left was to play the game and see if it lived up to the hype. And we're here today to dive into the gameplay and see whether this game really is survival horror at its finest, or whether it should have been left in 1998 where it started. So, let's do this. 
So Resident Evil 2 picks up after the events of the first game, with Raccoon City having been overrun by the undead. You play as either Leon S. Kennedy, a rookie cop who's on his way to Raccoon City to start his first day of work at the RPD, or Claire Redfield, the younger sister of Chris Redfield, the main protagonist of the first game, who is searching for her brother who hasn't been answering her calls. Now, each character has two different campaigns that you can play through, though when you boot up the game, you'll only have access to their A campaigns, also known as their first playthrough. Each of the characters has their own differences that set them apart, though you'll be following the same basic route through the game, with only a few changes here and there. You start in the RPD, make your way to the city, then to the sewers, and then to Umbrella's underground lab. Now, when you boot up the game, you get the choice of picking either Leon and Claire, and once you've made your choice, you'll be thrust into the game world. I wouldn't worry about who you choose to play as first, each campaign is the same length, and while each character may have slight differences such as weapon loadouts, the difficulty is roughly the same on both paths. You'll also have the option to select between Standard Mode, Hardcore Mode, and Assisted Mode, and I'd recommend Standard Mode to start you off. Assisted Mode is for people who are new to the series or who simply want to enjoy the story, while Hardcore Mode is for hardcore fans of the series who enjoy an intense challenge and the thrill of everything chewing you to pieces because someone thought the difficulty simply meant making the zombies literal bullet sponges that just don't go down no matter what you do. Now, if you've ever seen Resident Evil 2 for the PlayStation, then the story won't be anything really new to you. All the story beats from that game are once again hit, but the presentation and characters have been given a much needed upgrade. They've gone from this... About two months ago, there was this incident involving zombies. To this... And don't make my mistake. If you see one of those things, uniform or not, you do not hesitate. You take it out, or you run. Got it? All the side characters get more fleshed out, from Marvin Branagh, everyone's favorite cop, to Kendo, the owner of the gun shop from the original game, whose role has been expanded from his original appearance. Without spoiling anything, these changes are definitely for the better and serve to flesh out the different people that our heroes meet or hear about on their adventures, for better or for worse. Oh god, he almost what? Now, the real heavy story characters don't come into play until after you've found the three medallions in the police station and opened up the passage under the statue. Very soon after, depending on who you're playing as, you'll meet up with a side character that will remain a focal point of the story for the rest of the game. In Claire's campaign, she meets the young Sherry Birkin, a girl on the run from the monsters of Raccoon City who is looking for her mother in the middle of all this mess. And in Leon's campaign, you'll meet series staple, Ada Wong, giving us some crazy rich Asian housewife realness mixed with her ability to remain an absolute badass in every single situation. These side characters appear in cutscenes and accompany the players at certain points in each campaign, but still, for the most part, you'll be playing as Leon and Claire with nobody else around. Hell, Leon and Claire don't even interact all that much, meeting once at the police station before vanishing until the final 15 minutes of the game. So get used to Sherry and Ada because they really fill the character void and help to drive the story along. So much so, in fact, that each character has their own special level in each campaign that you play. Neither level is particularly long, but each level is uniquely tailored to their skill sets. Sherry, for example, cannot fight. Her ability to hide is her best asset, and you'll end up playing the scariest game of hide-and-seek in your life when you get to her orphanage level. As for Ada, she pulls out her inner watchdogs and reveals that technology in 1998 was pretty advanced, seeing as she can blow up fans, trace electronics, and do things that really shouldn't have been possible in the 90s. But hey, it's a game about a zombie outbreak. Is immersion in the time period really something people are concerned about? The only person who can feasibly pull this off anyway is Ada. 
Because she's Ada. She pulls everything off, including Leon, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> There's there's romantic tension there, that's the joke, that's that's what I'm trying to say. And by Resident Evil 6, they still haven't gotten together. I mean, seriously, it's been how many years? They're practically married by that point. Anyway, your main goal is, and will always be, to escape the city while bringing Umbrella's crimes to light as best you can. So strap on your big boy boots, grab some herbs, craft some ammo, and let's hit the streets of Raccoon City. God damn it! So, what are you actually going to be doing in this game, gameplay-wise? Well, your aim is to explore your environment, collect resources, complete your objectives, and most importantly, stay alive. Zombies, lickers, and other nasties will want to kill you, and if you want to survive the night, you'll need to understand how things work in the RPD. When you first start the game, Leon and Claire will be outfitted with a standard pistol, which uses standard ammo, which you can often find lying around in different rooms in the early game. Your first instinct might be to start going for headshots, taking down every zombie you see and carving a path through your foes, and in any other game, that might actually work. But not in Resident Evil 2. For whatever reason, the zombies within Raccoon City have developed super thick skulls because you can sink over 10 bullets into their craniums and they won't go down. Headshots are not an instant kill unless you score an elusive critical hit, or you have a shotgun literally inches from their face. So take my advice, rethink everything you know about zombies and go into this game with a fresh mind. It will help. Zombies in Resident Evil 2 are super resilient and can be quite the bullet sponges if you're not careful, but there are some ways in which you can effectively manage these creatures while retaining some of your precious ammo. Firstly, aim for the legs. Unless you've got a shotgun or super powerful ammo, which is exceptionally rare, so why the hell would you waste it on a normal zombie? Aiming for the head or the torso is a waste of bullets. Because of the realistic damage the bullets do to zombies when you shoot their legs enough times, their legs will actually start to break apart, rendering zombies into a crawling state where their mobility is significantly lowered. This makes them much easier to deal with, and as long as you're careful walking past them, you can avoid damage altogether. Secondly, if you can't aim for the legs, shoot the zombie until they stagger back slightly, then run past them while they're stunned. Killing every zombie in the game is a horrible idea. Only kill the enemies that you know will interfere in your route and get in your way. Because ammo in this game is limited and you do not want to end up with no ammo and a horde of zombies knocking at your door. Who is it? Oh, Jesus, hi. Thirdly, if you happen to have a knife equipped after knocking a zombie to the ground, you can proceed to slice them with your knife to see if they are still alive. If the zombie reacts to your slice, it's still kicking and you should keep slicing at them. If the zombie doesn't react, it's dead and you can move on with your day. Sure, your knife may lose some durability, but it's better to be safe than sorry. Due to how knives work in this game, you only get three major uses before they break, so using them to cut up grounded zombies is actually a better use of your weapon's durability. Now, as with my Hyperlight Drifter video, one of the best ways to stay alive is to keep some distance between yourself and your opponents. They move deceptively fast when they stagger towards you, and the more distance between you and the creatures that want to murder you, the better. And if you end up in a cramped space cornered by zombies with nowhere to go... Well, you probably brought that one on yourself. Good luck, have fun. And let's not even get started on liquors. These speedy bastards move at the speed of sound and will annihilate you if you're not prepared to fight them. One claw swipe can take away half your health and lickers are extremely durable. I wouldn't even bother trying to take them down with your generic pistol. Wait until you have a weapon that's a bit more powerful, like Leon's shotgun or Claire's grenade launcher, which you should have by the time you fight your first licker, by the way. So if you don't have those weapons yet and you found your first licker, go back and make it a priority to find them. However, while lickers are powerful, you can often hear them before you see them, and in this game they have a very fatal flaw that you can definitely use to your advantage. Lickers are completely blind, 
relying solely on hearing in order to detect you. This means that you can actually sneak by lickers as long as you move slowly enough. Some of the tensest moments in my playthroughs came from needing to walk past lickers because I couldn't afford to waste ammo or fight them due to my health. Just be aware that even when slowly walking past them, lickers can still get suspicious and will often move around to follow you. Just keep moving and only break into a run when you're sure you're far enough away to avoid alerting the creature. You'll also find a whole host of other creepy crawlies waiting for you in Resident Evil 2, but I think I'll let you discover some of the nightmares lurking beneath the city for yourselves. Though, for you arachnophobic players out there like myself, the giant spiders from the original have been cut from the game this time around. Trust me, I was as relieved as you. Survival horror is all about item management and staying alive, and there are a lot of items to manage in this game, so let's list off the basics. When you start the game, you'll have eight inventory slots, though you'll always have a gun in one slot, probably ammo in another, so that leaves you with six slots to work with. You'll be collecting a variety of items, some important to puzzles, while some are resources that you'll use up across the game. You've got different types of ammunition for all the different guns you can find, as well as said guns that will take up space in your inventory as well, and weapon parts that combine with specific guns to make them stronger, sometimes at the cost of an extra slot in your inventory. My advice regarding weapons, only keep ammo on you for guns that you've got equipped, keep your guns loaded to maximum, as well as if you have five bullets in your inventory and five open spaces for bullets in your gun, reloading that gun will grant you a free slot for items where those five bullets used to be. It's the little nuances like that which will get you far in this game. And equip any weapon parts that you come across. These items are naturally discovered as you progress through the game, and you will increase your inventory size as you progress as well, assuming you find the hip pouches strewn across Raccoon City. So you won't have too much trouble, at least in Leon's campaign. I found gun management to be a little more hectic in Claire's campaign, as I had five different guns in my inventory, which made me a bit of a hot mess when it came to organizing stuff, since you can only have four guns equipped, I don't even know why I had five. Now, if you've ever played a Resident Evil game before, then you'll know that healing is a very important aspect of gameplay that will help you to stay alive as you explore your surroundings. Your health will be shown in your inventory screen and will start at a nice green, but as you take damage, it will decrease to yellow, then to red, then you're dead. If your health is in the danger zone, you need to heal, and in Resident Evil 2, there are two different ways in which you can heal yourself. You can use herbs, or you can use first aid sprays, both of which can be found around the city. First aid sprays are full heal items, which will always bring you back up to maximum health when used, while herbs are a little more intuitive. There are three different types of herbs within the game, green herbs, red herbs, and blue herbs. The green herbs are your healing items, healing a small amount of HP if you use them. Blue herbs can heal you from poisons and toxins, which will come in handy at a certain point in the game, while red herbs actually don't do anything. At least, not when you find them. You see, you can combine herbs to enhance their effects, and trust me, combining herbs is the only way to go in this game. If you want to focus on healing, there are two combinations in the early game that will work really well for you. You can either combine two green herbs, or one red herb and one green herb to create healing combinations. Now, while combining various green herbs with other green herbs sounds great at the start, it's actually not worth it, as combining a red and green herb gives you a full heal, just like a first aid spray. It's always worth combining red and green herbs for maximum efficiency. While blue herbs can remove toxins, combining them with a red herb also gives you a buff that allows you to take less damage, which is invaluable when taking on crowded rooms or multiple enemies. And of course, the best recipe is when you mix one of every herb together to create the ultimate mixed herb. This herb will fully heal you, reduce the damage you take, and protect you from poison. So whenever you get the chance, 
try to make a combination of red, blue, and green for the best effects possible. If you're still confused on how to combine different herbs though, check the link below in the description for a full guide on changing up your herbs and combining them to make the best combinations possible. Aside from herbs, you'll also find various different types of gunpowder lying around the RPD as well. Gunpowder can be used to craft ammo for your chosen character's weapons. For example, with Leon's campaign, combining two gunpowder gives you more handgun ammo, but if you combine normal gunpowder and high-grade gunpowder, you'll create shotgun shells. And if you combine two high-grade gunpowder, you create mag ammo. It works exactly the same in Claire's campaign, only her high-grade gunpowder is a different color, so what she can craft with gunpowder is a little bit different. Crafting with gunpowder is all about what bullets you need for the situation at hand, so make sure to assess your situation, figure out whether you actually need more ammo at that point, or whether you can afford to store the gunpowder for later use, and move on. You can also find large gunpowder, which works like basic gunpowder, only you get double the ammo from using it. Keep in mind though, that means you can't make double mag ammo or submachine gun ammo with large gunpowder, because it doesn't work like high grade. Now with all your perishables out of the way, it's time to focus on key items. And sometimes that's quite literal. Throughout the game, you will be tasked with various objectives such as find three medallions, or explore the RPD with the new keys you've discovered, etc, etc. So you'll be collecting various items that are needed to complete puzzles, which can either net you some new items like weapon parts and guns, or allow you to progress further in the game. So you might find a spade key somewhere, and now you can open the various spade doors within the RPD. Or you might find a roll of film that can be developed in the dark room, save room, to reveal hints to future puzzles or combinations for various locked lockers or safes around the RPD. These key items are pretty simple to figure out, and once you've used them for their intended purpose, a red check mark will appear next to them in the inventory screen, meaning you're free to discard them and make room for more supplies. This is a brilliant way of letting the player know if an item still has use, and allows the player to seriously manage their inventory in a greater fashion, taking into account when you'll be discarding items, etc. Aside from the usual keys, medallions, and film, you may also come across more unique items. Perhaps you'll get a closed box or a red book? Whenever you get an item that seems suspicious, always examine it. When you examine an item, you get the option to shift it around, and more often than not, you'll discover small points of interaction on the item that will help you solve a future puzzle. Did you get a cardboard box, but you want what's inside it? Click examine, head over to the tape sealing the box, and press X. BAM! The box opens, and you get what's inside. Did you get a car key that can apparently open a police car, but none of the cars have any prompts? Examine the item and click the unlock button. This extra level of detail makes key items very intuitive, and examining an item like a badge to discover that it doubles as a USB really shows how well thought out the puzzles in this game are. So examine everything you come across that isn't a perishable item, you never know what you might discover. Now, key items are fun, but sometimes you just want an item that you know can help you handle the zombie outbreak. So, let's talk about boards and sub-weapons. Throughout the RPD, you can find various wooden boards that, when in your inventory, can be used to block certain windows on the first floor of the police station. Because zombies will constantly be knocking on the glass, asking to come in, and unless you want all your favorite locations to become swamped with zombies, you'll want to board up all the windows you can. The window outside of your first major safe room is where you'll encounter your first set of boards, and yes, the game does want you to board that window up. Trust me, you're going to go by that window a whole lot in your adventure, so keeping it boarded up is really the only option unless you actively want to die. You'll find boards here, there, and everywhere, but you'll never have enough of the wooden planks to block every single blockable window, so try to block the windows that you know you'll be coming past later. If the window's in a room or hallway you know you're not going back to, there's no need to block it after all. But sometimes blocking windows just isn't enough. Maybe the zombies have already gotten in and you're trapped by some zombies and you don't have the ammo to shoot your way out. This is where sub-weapons come in. 
there are three different types of sub-weapon. The knife, the flash grenade, and the hand grenade, which can be found throughout your journey. Sub-weapons can be used to fight off zombies, and sometimes chucking a hand grenade at your opponents can clear a path for you to move on. But more often than not, it's a good idea to actually hoard your sub-weapons as much as you can, because if a zombie grabs you while you have a sub-weapon in your inventory, you'll get a prompt allowing you to use that weapon and get out of a zombie's grab without taking damage. Flash grenades and hand grenades are pretty simple. You jam them into a zombie's mouth, get a moment of invincibility to run once the zombie staggers back, and then BOOM! A hand grenade will more often than not kill a zombie outright, while a flash grenade will briefly stun any zombies in the room. Your combat knife, however, is a little more risky to use. You see, using your knife to escape a grab means stabbing that knife into your opponent, which can be done up to three times before the knife breaks. The problem, you can't retrieve your knife until you've downed the zombie you just stabbed. Unlike grenades, you do need to continue fighting in order to retrieve your sub-weapon. So it becomes a question of, do you need the knife moving forwards? Is it worth wasting some quick ammo to take this zombie, liquor, or other creature down to retrieve your blade? And honestly, that's up to you. I found myself not using knives as much during the late game, as you can't stack them, unlike grenades, but you might find more use from the knives than I did. Just be aware that if a zombie grabs you from behind, you won't be able to protect yourself with your sub-weapon. You need to be facing in the direction of your foe for your sub-weapon to be effective. So you now know the basics of Resident Evil 2. You know what items to look out for, how to down zombies, the secret tactics of avoiding liquors, but there are still a few things to go over, like the map screen and save rooms. In Resident Evil 2, the map screen is your best friend and is the most intuitive it has ever been for the franchise. You will have to find maps around the RPD and other locations, of course, but they're not too difficult to obtain. Just make sure you check every area. So when you load up the map screen, you'll see some rooms are red and some rooms are blue. If a room is blue, that means everything has been found or solved in that room, and thus you have no reason to return there. If a room is red, it means there's an item or a puzzle that needs to be solved still in that room. Items you pass, but don't pick up, will be marked on the map for reference, so if you left some handgun ammo or a herb behind, you'll know where they are so you can grab them the next time you head on through. The map will also keep track of any locked doors you come across as long as you interact with the door, including whether the door is locked with a key, a chain, or whether you need to unlock the door from the other side to open it. The map screen is just amazing. Now, save rooms are the last thing I need to go over, and they're your safe spaces throughout the game. Save rooms will have a typewriter and an item box, as well as a few extra resources for you to grab, and are good places to take a breather. Enemies cannot enter safe rooms, so you won't have to worry about a zombie or a liquor chewing your face off. Now, the typewriter is pretty self-explanatory if you've played a Resident Evil game. It is where you save your game, and you've got quite a few slots to use up as you play through the game, and I'd recommend not saving over your past saves if you can help it. You never know when you might need to restart a save, especially on hardcore mode. But we'll get to that. But the real highlight of any safe room is the item box. This magical beast will protect your items from the harsh dangers of the outside world, storing your items in a location beyond the confines of time and space. Item boxes are all connected to each other, meaning if you place an item in the item box in the dark room safe room, if you head to the item box in the main hall, you'll find that item there as well. Your storage system is your best friend and you should make sure to store any items you don't need. My preferred loadout has always been any guns I own, some ammo for said guns, one healing item, be it a herb mixture or a first aid spray, one sub weapon, be it a knife or a stack of grenades, as well as any key items I may need on my venture outside of the confines of the safe room. Try to make sure you don't have too much stuff in your inventory though, otherwise you'll end up finding important items that you simply cannot carry, and backtracking can be quite the pain if you end up doing it too many times. Thank you, Large Gear, for taking two slots in my inventory when I've got so much shit already! And, well, 
That's about it. I have bestowed upon you all the information I can possibly give you on enemies you need to watch out for, the items you need to collect, and mechanics you'll need to get to grips with. However, earlier on I did mention that each character has two campaigns, so I guess I should elaborate on that. Each character has two different scenarios, an A scenario and a B scenario. The A scenario is your first playthrough, so if you picked Leon to play first, you'll take on his A scenario. In the A scenario, the character of your choice arrives at the police station first, meets Marvin, and has a pretty normal experience. However, once you complete a character's A scenario, you will unlock the opposite character's B scenario. For example, you beat the game with Leon, you unlock the B scenario with Claire. The B scenario follows the other main character's journey through Raccoon City, happening in tandem with the events of the other character's A scenario. So, if you do Claire's B scenario, Leon already made it to the police station before you, and the game starts when you meet up in the courtyard by the locked gate, with you playing as whoever is on the outside with the zombies. In this mode, enemy placements are changed, you'll encounter lickers and other terrifying creatures much earlier than you would in a character's A scenario, and that's about it though. You'll still visit the same locations, solve the same puzzles, uh, with the exception of the sewer chess puzzle and the computer codes in the underground lab, which change depending on which scenario you're in, and ultimately aside from meeting Marvin, the scenario doesn't actually differentiate from the story too much. However, there is a major plot hole when it comes to the A-B scenarios. Because both parts are meant to be happening simultaneously, yet that also means both Leon and Claire will end up fighting the same boss battles, in the same locations, at different times from each other, and in context? That's kind of impossible. Now, this plot hole can be fixed if you imagine that the character you're not playing as simply doesn't fight any bosses you encounter, but still, it's a major oversight, and I feel this could have been handled much better than it actually was. Either way, you'll still want to play a character's B scenario to get the full story and the true ending of the game, so keep that in mind. So, that's it for the main game. There are some unlockables, but I'll cover them in our tips and tricks segment, so here are some tips, tricks, and other things you may want to know before picking up this game. Oh no. Did you guys really think I'd honestly forget about the trench coat wearing, fedora rocking, power walking man himself, Mr. X? For those of you not in the know, Mr. X was a character who only appeared in the original Resident Evil 2's B campaign, stalking whichever character you were playing as at the time. Being one of the original Tyrant models Umbrella developed, his goal is quite simple. Kill any and all witnesses. And to this end, Mr. X will pursue Leon and Claire throughout the game with the express desire of bringing about your demise with a lovely smackdown. From the heavy sound of his footsteps thumping behind you, to his towering and imposing figure, as well as his ability to speed walk in a way that makes professional models jealous, this is a creature whom you really don't want to mess with. It's a shame then that you're going to be encountering Mr. X constantly throughout the game as he attempts to kill you. So what do you need to know about him? Well. He's invulnerable, so you can't kill him. However, you can down him for a short period of time if you sink enough bullets into him. However, this is not recommended. Mr. X will still end up pursuing you, and by the time he shows up, either on your A or B scenario, there will be zombies and lickers all across the RPD that need to be prioritized. I'd rather take a hit from Mr. X than get killed by lickers due to a lack of ammo. Mr. X is a terrifying creature, and by far, the best part of this game. But he has some weak points. Mr. X has specific rooms in the RPD that he cannot enter. These rooms include the save rooms, the star's office, the clock tower, the interrogation and observation rooms, and specifically for scenario B, the safe room under the goddess statue in the main hall. Use these rooms to your advantage to plan your route and keep yourself safe from Mr. X's wrath. 
though for being such a big guy, he's not actually terribly difficult to avoid. His attacks are slow and can be baited if you really need to get around him, or you can use the various loops around the RPD to get to where you need to go instead. It's also worth noting that he takes a few moments to get through doors, so when in doubt, use doors to your advantage to block him as best you can. Be aware though that Mr. X is drawn to sound. If you run or shoot your gun, he'll begin to home in on you, so if he's not around, try walking instead. You can often hear him when he's close by from the sound of his footsteps above or below you, as well as the sound of him opening and closing doors. The sound design of Resident Evil 2 really shines when Mr. X is chasing you, and the building tension, followed by the swell of the music as he spots you, as well as the hauntingly terrifying track that plays as he begins his pursuit, it makes you wonder how Nemesis will be when they decide to remake Resident Evil 3. So, here are a few tips and tricks to help you along if you decide to give Resident Evil 2 a shot. There's a first aid spray in the toilets and the RPD which you can grab before triggering the zombies to appear. With Claire's grenade launcher, one flame round can take out a liquor in standard mode as long as you aim at the center of its body. Puzzle solutions in Leon's scenario A can be used in Claire's scenario A, allowing you to open safes, crack open lockers, and complete puzzles in a quicker manner. Shooting off Mr. X's hat gets you an achievement. Do it if you dare. The IVs from the original game do make a return, but make sure to have sub-weapons on when you deal with them. If they grab you and you don't have a sub-weapon, it's an instant kill. The game's difficulty is adaptive, so if you're struggling with a boss or a section and you just keep dying, just keep trying. That's the survival horror way after all. Bosses are meant to take up most of your ammo, so don't be concerned if you're forced to start from square one after progressing, and once you defeat a boss, make sure to check the arena for any stray items that may be lying around. Missing the ink ribbon save mechanic from the older games? Hardcore modes got you covered, so you can have all the limited saves you want. Be aware that when climbing down the rooftop ladder on Leon's campaign, the ladder will always break. However, in Claire's campaign, it will remain usable. And adding on to the last point, do everything you need to do in the RPD before heading down the rooftop ladder as Leon, as after that point, you'll need to spawn Mr. X in order to get back to the main police station. The cable car at the end of the sewers is your point of no return. Once you enter it, there's no going back. In the sewers, there's one specific roll of film that will reveal two different drawers, which contain important items that you can find in the police station. You cannot open these drawers until you develop the film. Beating either Claire or Leon's B scenario will unlock the fourth survivor mode. Good luck. Beating the fourth survivor mode will unlock the best part of the Resident Evil franchise, Tofu Mode! Once again, good luck. You will be ranked on your playthrough based on the time taken. Saves will not affect your grade. Try to aim for an S rank as you can unlock various features by completing the game in a good time. In Claire's boss battle on the train turntable, shoot the eyes on the chest of the boss with the minigun. Don't waste ammo shooting anywhere else as it does less damage. Check on Marvin when you get back to the RPD. I'm sure he's all right. Always shoot the big pulsing eyes. You'll know it when you see it. Struggling with the library puzzle because Mr. X won't leave you alone? This is the one time in the game where downing him for a short time is probably the best course of action. When you get enough game overs, the game will often ask if you want to change to assisted mode. Don't do it. You can't change back to normal mode if you switch to assisted mode. If you're playing on the PS4, be aware that you can see your character's health bar by looking at the controller's LED light as it changes color depending on your life bar. And most importantly, always remember to be aware of your surroundings, like me. So, was Resident Evil 2 the reimagining everybody hoped it would be? Yes. Yes it was. After Resident Evil 7, people weren't exactly sure where Capcom was going to take the franchise. People enjoyed the first person aspect of Resident Evil 7 and the return to survival horror, but what was next? 
And if future Resident Evil games are going to follow the formula that Resident Evil 2 2019 has laid out, I think this is going to be a golden age for Resident Evil coming up. The zombies are the most terrifying they have ever been. The mutated creatures are the most disgusting they have ever been. And the tyrant is as terrifying as he always wanted to be. Without a doubt, this game is going to succeed in bringing the survival horror genre to a new generation of gamers if they can stop playing Fortnite. Some may complain about the lack of ammo or that everything's too difficult, but that's kind of the point. Survival horror is not meant to be easy, and if you want an easy experience, you can always click on assisted mode, and if maybe that's not your cup of tea and you're just not getting to grips with the game, maybe it's not the right game for you to be purchasing. That isn't to say this game doesn't have its faults, though. Certain locations from the original Resident Evil 2 sadly didn't make the transition to the remake, which some diehard fans might be a little disappointed about, as well as some design decisions that I didn't really agree with. For example, when you start Scenario B, you're constantly being bombarded by tutorials that you already got in Scenario A, and to unlock Scenario B, you have to beat the game, so why are we getting more tutorials when we've beaten the game to unlock this specific campaign? I also think that while the soundtrack is okay for what it is, there's a distinct lack of ambient noises that kind of remind you that there is a city outside of the Raccoon City Police Department, and overall, I do think the original soundtrack holds up a little bit better, even if Mr. X's theme is god tier in the remake. However, Capcom has recognized this, and if you do get the deluxe edition of the game, not only do you get some fancy costumes and guns, but you also get a toggle switch for the original soundtrack. However, if you don't own the deluxe edition of the game, you are going to have to purchase the soundtrack toggle switch yourself as DLC from either the PS4 store or from Steam. And I would say it's mostly worth it. The original soundtrack doesn't only just give you the original soundtrack itself, but it also gives you changed menu sounds, and there's just an extra layer of care that has been taken with this. However, it does disappoint me that this is paid DLC, because we've seen with other remakes from last year, like Spyro Reignited Trilogy, that you can still offer the original soundtrack without having to make it DLC. And given it is old music, I just feel like it's a little bit of a slap in the face making you pay money for it when it is a feature that people would have praised to high heaven if it was in the base game. But you know, Capcom needs to make that moolah. Still, we are getting three DLC campaigns on the 15th of February, so I guess I can't complain too much. Capcom delivers the free DLC when they want to, and it is entitled Ghost Stories, and we'll be following three characters that didn't really have major relevance in the actual plot of Resident Evil 2. I think it's like a what-if scenario, and you should definitely check those out, because they're gonna be free, as in, you don't need to pay for them. Overall though, how do I feel about this game? Well, Resident Evil 2 for the PlayStation 4 2019 gets a Platinum Star. Platinum Stars go to games that I feel are at the tip top of their genre, or evoke feelings that other titles simply cannot achieve through their gameplay, story, and overall experience. Resident Evil 2 brought me back to my survival horror roots, and we could say that Resident Evil 7 did something similar, however, unlike Resident Evil 7, 2 was consistent and enjoyable the entire way through, whereas Resident Evil 7 took a bit of a quality dip after you got to the Lucas segment of the game. The RPD is a maze of twists and turns. The new updated stories for the side characters give them a lot more charm and a lot more tragedy, and the sound design in this game is the best the Resident Evil series has ever had. Ever. 
I may not like some of the DLC practices, like paying for a soundtrack toggle switch, but to be honest, this is nothing new to the Resident Evil franchise. Even all the old games had paid costumes you could purchase, so I'm not gonna hold it against Resident Evil 2, I'm gonna hold it against Capcom. And while there were some story inconsistencies, the story was never the main focal point of the game. It was always the survival horror gameplay that people were excited to see, relive, and experience. And it's the best it has ever been. Well done, Capcom. Let's just hope that Resident Evil 3 is on the way as well, because everybody wants to see what Nemesis is going to be like in this engine, and if he's gonna be anything like Mr. X, and given he is more aggressive than Mr. X, I think we're in for a good time.